without the calendar. Dab that Sharpie on the tip of your tongue like a good old fashioned quill. And let's get started crossing off the no-no days we no longer want to commemorate and the flawed humans we deem worthy of idolizing. Today's going to be a day you're not going to like, kiddos. Today's going to be a day where we take away reasons to take off work. So with the world on fire, riots in the streets, and the entire world waiting to see if America finally decides that all her peoples are created equal, let's shift the discussion a bit to the silly things we set aside to celebrate and what it really says about us. Welcome to the podcast. It took me a while to get there. I didn't have HBO when The Sopranos first ran, and honestly, I went through my gangster mafia stage way early in life. Too early. And it kind of died when Geraldo opened Capone's empty vault. Spoilers. Way to destroy a little boy's dream of a fig. First of all, I'm talking about Columbus Day, and I know there are a lot of differing opinions on the subject, especially from the proud Italian Americans, so let me just preface my opinion with this. The Sopranos exist, so I'm not sure how ready I am to hear about a blaspheming Italian heritage. However, America's come a long way in a short period, so it seems, so maybe we take another academic look at shows and movies like this someday soon. Season two. But as someone whose links to Italian heritage are about as thick as angel hair, I didn't watch that show and come away with the sense that taking Columbus as an Italian hero seriously mattered more than maintaining unhealthy stereotypes. Not to get any hate mail, just to say that I'm aware of the Italian heritage angle to the discussion, and I mean no disrespect, I just can't talk about it because, well, as a non-Italian, I try to embrace Italy's rich heritage in ways that aren't stereotypical or pandering. Like Olive Garden, for example. Still, the topic of Columbus Day was covered in The Sopranos. It, it sparked this idea in my head from deep within the recesses of my noggin. <laughs> so you guessed it. It's time to overthink Columbus Day. Uh, I'm wholly against supporting Christopher Columbus as a holiday for more than one reason. First off, it showcases our own moronity as a nation. <laughs> it's like McDonald's celebrating Dave Thomas for Founders Day. <clears throat> An Irish saint, giants, Vikings, and even Amerigo Vespucci could be heralded as the heroes of the North American continent, with Columbus's discovery considered a double failure. He didn't land in technically undiscovered territory, and he didn't make it to the Indies, where he thought he was going. <clears throat> All in all, examined even beyond whitewashed history and his own actual accomplishments. Well, the man was either an oaf or a sham artist. <laughs> Maybe a bit of both. The wake of wreckage, <laughs> no pun intended, was chaotic. Still, even with the arrogance of explorers of the area, assuming they've discovered lands with people actually already living there notwithstanding, what makes Columbus the dude the textbooks tell us found America? We'll get to that in a bit. First, let's examine the groups who actually have a legitimate claim to the founder's title. I read the Book of Mormon about the same time I ordered Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard. Thanks to that cool volcano commercial, cultism. It was also around the time I started reading the Star Wars novels, cultism. I was fascinated by fake religions, even back then. I studied many of them. The, the ones that just started because someone just said so fewer than a few hundred years ago. Not that I don't respect people who believe in these offshoot cults, I just think they're offshoot cults. <clears throat> but really, all religion is a cult if you think about it. So, see, I've instantly gone from offending just some people to offending pretty much everybody. Problem solved. Quality. The Book of Mormon pretty much lays out that uh, 
Not only will Jesus return to Missouri when he comes back, but Jesus appeared in North America on his three-day layover after the crucifixion. Had to be. He ascended in the Christian Bible, so whether that was just like a psych to his disciples while he went and hung out with his real friends, who knows? Maybe it was after the resurrection. It was part of the farewell tour, apparently. He only had one, unlike the eagles. But thank you very much. Regardless, Jesus, according to the Mormons, discovered America, right? I mean, 2,000 years ago has to beat them all, right? Wrong. Still, even 600 years before Christ, Mormons buy that an ancient tribe of Israelites managed to get to America. They still celebrate and reenact the whole thing in upstate New York every year on the hill where Joseph Smith allegedly found his mysterious gold tablet that only he could read with the special device that was destroyed shortly after he translated. You know what? <clears throat> anyway, none of that is important. It's a whole Broadway show. Just know that in Mormonology, Israelites hit the U.S. long before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, I'm not sure what you believe. Wow. Okay, so we aren't all Mormons, and we don't all buy that Jesus or the Israelites set foot on American soil. After all, where's the evidence? Receipts? Nada. It's religion. If we're able to be proven, it would be called fact, not faith, right? It's easy to believe in facts. Faith? That takes work. So maybe believing in facts isn't as easy, but you're listening. You're clearly one of the ones who do. So if the Mormons don't have a legitimate, provable claim to the discovery, let's examine someone with, well, more than just a similar name and questionable lineage to yours truly, St. Brendan, the Irish monk, who sailed the Atlantic on his rickety boat made out of wooden animal skin. Yeah, man. <laughs> Bro seriously took off from Brandon Creek, Ireland, in basically a primitive bongo drum. <laughs> saint Brendan is a patron saint for the travelers, specifically seafarers. In fact, tales of Saint Brendan the Bold's travels are that of legend. And they're just that. <clears throat> legend. At least his travels to North America seem to be. The year I was born, a crew took off from the same point, a similar vessel, just to prove it could be done back in the 6th century. That's right. In the 500s, it's said that an Irish saint made his way to North America. That's a millennia before Columbus, with mountains and waterways named after him, and even a school in Miami. St. Brendan deserves a little more love, don't you think? <laughs> okay. Okay, so the Irish saints have about as much legit claim as the Latter-day Saints. Like the old millennia slogan says, For saintly sightseeing, see America. You can still find scrawlings in caves, I'm pretty sure. Look, if we're going to talk ancient Israelites, Jesus Christ, and ancient saints and bongo drums, let's just go ham on the weird stuff and talk about the giants. No, not Brooklyn, San Fran, or New York. We have the giants of the northern border. If you've never researched the legends of the giant humanoids in Vancouver, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, New York, New England, the Ohio Valley, Missouri, well, look. Friends, I'm not into conspiracy theories, but there's some serious evidence that gargantuan humanoid beings were here shortly before colonists were. And if someone comes over and sees a seven foot plus tall giant, I'm not sure this is the place I'm staying. I'm not saying I believe giants existed outside of medical anomalies, but uh, skeletons have been found. A lot more than statistically explainable. Photos exist. Native American tribes held them in reverence. It, it isn't just here either. In Asia, Mongolia, and what seems to make sense in a migration map, these giants, they could have very well existed. Still, it's hard to know anything about these mysterious people since humans do what humans do. Remove the scary thing. <laughs> I mean, even if you allow for the telephone game phenomenon, you know, where... A seven-foot skeleton ends up being 17 feet tall or long, long, wait, long. Skeletons don't stand long. Yet. However, across the Ohio Valley and Kansas and more, skeletons of over seven feet have been found, some over eight and nine feet tall. Look, even by today's standards, okay? That's so out there by the odds. 
Look at the entire world, the National Basketball Association, the NCAA, high schools. Basketball is big business. And no, being tall doesn't make you good, Manute Bowl, or I'm sorry, the late Sean Bradley. But if you think some team would shy away from a player who is a foot shorter than the basket, you're whackers. Manute Bowl was seven and a half feet. Bradley was an inch taller. Both were bean poles who could have been snapped in two by Shaquille O'Neal, who, who's seven foot one-ish, but like 400 pounds. The men we look at as giants, our athletes, <laughs> they rarely push past six foot, six inches tall. And the taller, the thinner, usually. Now, I'm not trying to convince you giants were real. I'm not entirely convinced. That's another podcast. But it's incredibly fascinating when you factor in with the number of giant skeletons on Earth, just how many graves would have had to have been exposed to statistically match up? It's in the millions, multiple millions. Another theory lays out that China, who did manage to sail all the way to what is now Kenya, may have made it all the way around Africa to get to the east coast of America. Now, there's zero evidence beyond just wild speculations and bloviations of a proud land. <laughs> Newfoundland, known to the Vikings as Vinland, was settled for about a decade by Leif Erikson. That's been proven, see? Over in Iceland, the Netherlands, where Leif was trekking, grapes didn't really grow well. But on the eastern seaboard of Canada, oh, they found a lot of resources they didn't have back home. And what do we know of Vikings, kids? They love to drink. So for Valhalla! But the Native American North Americans weren't keen on Viking settlement. Vikings were Vikings, so it's clear they didn't get along, but they traded, but they also killed each other. I mean, it wasn't always bad. There's evidence the two groups intermingled some, and it doesn't always appear to be bloody, but it certainly was tense. The Ericsson stayed for a while, then left. Settled, not colonized. Discovered? I mean... Canada, sure. And where's the commitment, right? Okay, so North America. It counts, but who discovered America? The United States, you know? And why are we celebrating the one guy we know who didn't? Let's take a little closer look at the man whose name freckles America with 54 cities, counties, districts, or otherwise designated by the census, named after or inspired by Christopher Columbus. In fact, according to biz journals, about 2.7 million Americans live in a place named after this dude. What do the actual records of the time period of Columbus's life tell us? He was born in Genoa in 1451 and died in 1506. He was barely 40 when he set sail across the Atlantic to find Asia and the riches and spices with which that land was overflowing. Surrounded by books most of his life, Columbus lived his pre-sailing days in Portugal for a long time. Working in sort of a bookstore, he was a map maker, a sailor. He sailed up the coast to Iceland, down the South African coast as well. He was a student of history, geography, travel. Something to note here is that Columbus was formally educated like many of that era. There's this misconception that flat earthers were rampant back then, but just like now, that's only with the uneducated wackadoos. Columbus, an educated fleet admiral, and his scurvy-ridden crew, they walked different paths in society. So unlike many of his crew, Columbus believed the earth was round. An educated intellectual who has to debate with someone who isn't... <clears throat> well, that can certainly relate to the frustration uh, Columbus must have felt. His irrational fear of dropping off the edge of the world. That constant hearing that in your ear may have seemed intellectually wearisome to him. Constantly hearing about that from his crew had to be exasperating for an educated man. The Silk Road, the treacherous path through uh, all sorts of terrain, which linked Europe to Asia, it had traditionally been the means to get goods to and from. Except that in the centuries after Marco Polo, the Turks, who could be real jerks, controlled that area and shut down those paths. 
explorers doing what explorers do, Columbus figured he could get there faster, hitting the virgin waters of the Atlantic. Again, back then, going by what they knew, the logic was solid. Look, the Greeks were probably the first to formulate the idea that sailing west would lead straight to the east. Little did they know they'd have to pay a, pass a cape either way they sailed, you know, if Asia was the plan. Remember, Chris has lived in Portugal for a while now, and so he puts this plan together to get to China. He gets in front of the king of Portugal, John II. I mean, Portugal listened, but when the plan was reviewed, the royal experts said there was no way China was that close. It was impossible to stock a fleet to survive the reality of that trek. Columbus tried. Undeterred, he heads to Spain. Now, Columbus hadn't even set foot in Spain. Still, he's got friends in high places. Good enough, he gets before King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Their royal experts came to a similar conclusion. Columbus persisted for six years and even took to try and persuade France to back him. Now, that was enough for Spain to decide it was worth the risk. Columbus got his fleet, and he didn't have to convince the queen to sell her jewels. That's a folk tale. In fact, Spain had just conquered the lands of the Moors in the south of Spain. They, they had the money. <laughs> Understand this, too. Columbus was an Italian, not a Spaniard. He had red hair, and the manner in which he secured that fleet was... Well, that voyage was... It was sort of controversial in that he kept getting turned down and finally wore down Spain's royalty despite experts warning against the voyage. Needless to say, you had a red-headed Italian commanding a fleet of Spaniards. It, it's not like this was a tight crew. There was a lot of pushback and distrust in Columbus. Xenophobia was rampant. Their captain was a foreigner. You Really think there wasn't a single Spaniard on that trip who didn't think he deserved the wheel? What I'm saying is, this trip was one of the longest these men had ever been on, with no sight of land. Now really imagine that for a moment. These are men who believed the Earth was flat, and if their captain wasn't careful, he'd steer them straight into the sun when it set. Sea creatures, giant serpents, and crabs, and look, these sailors didn't have all the information we have today. And it wasn't like they were on the Carnival Fantasy cruise ship either. Open bar, no. Open barrel, maybe. But they weren't drinking because their boss was an ass. It, it was more to fend off the scurvy. Three weeks after setting sail, no sign of any kind of land whatsoever. His crew was going stir crazy, losing confidence in their leader. Columbus journaled that he felt like his crew was going mad, suicidal and threatening mutiny if he didn't turn around and head home. Columbus lied to his whole crew to convince them not to toss him overboard. He kept one set of logs with the accurate distance traveled, which only he saw. Another log, doctored to show a slower pace, was available for the crew to see. Again, these men were scared of falling off the earth, and given what they thought they knew of navigation maps back then, well... Game of Thrones was a lot more advanced. That bullshittery lasted about another two weeks. No land. Dude, Noah at least got an olive branch, right? No, I mean, his crew was done, son. So imagine Columbus backed into a corner by angry Spaniards. A whole boat of Inigo Montoya's and old Columbus has that extra pinky. So Chris says, okay, guys. The first man to spot land will get a fancy silk coat. <laughs> a contest is his Hail Mary. I mean, these guys don't care about a silk coat, right? They're going to die in the middle of the ocean. <sighs> Later that day, after Columbus ran, he ran so far away, he spotted a flock of seagulls or birds. It doesn't really matter what kind, but birds. And what do birds do? Well, Yes, they fly, but what do they do when they're done flying? They land on land. So Chris shouts, just like every Sesame Street fan in 1985, it says, follow that bird. So the next night around 2 a.m., a sailor by the name of Rodrigo de Triana on the Pinto shouted, land, land. Cannons fired. 
anchors dropped, and Columbus and the Spaniards disembarked on the beaches of the Bahamas. Yeah, not quite Asia at all. Not quite America. In fact, having taken several cruises there, I would like to insist that it is absolutely not America. I paid for an international vacation. The natives crowded the shores. No weapons. Maybe fishing spears and that sort of thing. <laughs> they were pretty much naked. Columbus, man, dude is lit right now. He is amazed at himself. He thinks he's walking the very shores Marco Polo walked. The ones on the islands just off the coast of India. What we call the East Indies Islands now. So he figures China and Japan must be just to the north, right? And if he set foot in the Indies, no, these must be... Indians. And so North America's native peoples were called Indians for far, far, far too long. Look, offensive, no, yeah, I mean, yeah, it is, yes, but on the surface, historically, look, calling these native people Indians is no different than calling an Italian a Spaniard. It's not necessarily racist, but it is terribly incorrect. He thought he landed in a place and called the natives he encountered a name of that place. Columbus was not racist for starting that. Columbus is racist for a lot of other reasons. Columbus and his fleet took off shortly after landing in this land he called San Salvador. The natives had other names for their land, but does that really matter? <laughs> They're pretty much extinct now. Tainos, the indigenous peoples of the West Indies as they're erroneously named today. He makes stops in Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, and he writes about how generous these natives were where he went, that they brought his people pretty much everything they had. I mean, history is written by the victors, but Columbus's writings seemed very positive toward the people. To a point, in Cuba, Columbus finds a river rich with gold deposits and starts getting samples of the land's resources, along with about 10 or so natives he plans to take back to Spain and train as interpreters. <clears throat> so, one of them doesn't make it back to Spain. I mean, that could happen to anybody. He builds a fort by the river, leaves some men there to do some of the heavy lifting while they wait for reinforcements. Columbus, now, he feels he's very confident he's found exactly where he's been looking for. So he packs his stuff and he heads back to Spain. I mean, it doesn't sound that bad, right? So Columbus gets back and he is given the hero treatment, parades and whatnot. The king and queen, they see this gold mask one of the native chiefs gave Chris and they set him up with 17 ships, 1,500 men and some women packed up and ready to colonize slash strip the resource-rich new world and convert the heathen natives to Christianity, bygones. <clears throat> Here's where it gets complicated. The gold he took back to Spain wasn't much more than they found in the mines back in Cuba. And the crops his left-behind crew planted? European crops in tropical conditions? They did what just about every houseplant I've ever owned did. Died. The Columbites, if you will, it would appear, took their frustrations out on the generous, affectionate, indigenous peoples. This was a catastrophic mess. Some of those left behinds decided to uh, export the natives, take their women, kill, take everything, basically enslave. When Columbus got back, these quote-unquote beautiful and affectionate people he had written about had been largely run off or turned against the Spaniards. A few years later, he had to go back to Spain and basically stand before the king and queen to answer for his horrendous handling of the new colony. Look, the guy could captain a ship, but well, barely captain a crew. Remember Rodrigo, the sailor who spotted land? Columbus kept the silk coat for himself, stating that he had seen a glimpse of land first. Oh, that rapscallion. <laughs> oh, and the historical error and uh, lesson of Ferdy and Izzy is, uh, why didn't they send a governor instead of a bunch of sailors? Well, who knew what they were going to find, right? They were trying to trade with China. When Chris got back to Spain, well, he was kind of shocked that the king and queen were still willing to support him. 
To be honest, the loot he tossed their way didn't hurt. With threats of uprising and just disarray in, again, what is now the Caribbean and not the mainland United States of America, Spain sent another eight ships <clears throat> to attack the Indies. Basically, this land is our land. This land is still our land. Get the hell off our land or get under our land. <clears throat> you know, it wasn't pretty. In 1498, Columbus set sail the Ocean Great, his third voyage to the New World. Remember, he's already been to Spain and back and then called back to Spain because of the terrible job he's doing. And surely he found America on this time around, right? <laughs> so the dates are wonky, but he got there, right? Eh, not so fast. He gets back. There is an uprising. Columbus lets his mouth write a million dollar check his five dollar rumpus can't cash. This new fella, Francisco de Bobadilla, sent an emissary by the queen and king to sort this mess out while well, he was promptly offended by Columbus. And let's be clear about something. Columbus wasn't just a poor governor. Columbus was a tyrant, a despot, hoarding all the profits and resources for himself and his brothers, corrupt and entitled with very questionable leadership skills. If Chris got the royal treatment on that first trip back to Spain, this trip back to the colony was quite the opposite. He was hated. They tried killing him. So, Bobadilla and Columbus get in this tangle, except Columbus is temporarily blinded from the carbonite chamber. He accidentally knocks Bobadilla into the Sarlacc pit. Wait. Stop. That's Boba Fett. Not Bobadilla. Two different cats altogether. My bad. Rewind. So, Chris and his brothers were shipped right back to Spain. Now, the king and queen pardoned him, but they knew enough to take the islands away from Columbus. He was just a terrible leader, really. So with no more claim to govern the new lands, he was allowed to go back one more time. This time to explore past the islands. Right? Florida? Texas? Louisiana? Okay, even the Gulf of Mexico, surely he could land. Swear to all the gods, Termites ate his ships to pieces. What was left of the fleet beached in Jamaica. I had a little fun at Sands. No, I'm kidding. Christopher Columbus, the man who discovered America, was marooned like Gilligan for about a year until he was rescued and shipped back to Spain. An embarrassment and shame. I know. <laughs> this makes Columbus sound like a buffoon. Doesn't help if you believe that he really didn't lie to his crew about the logbooks, as some historians cite. They tie some of his comments to draw the assertion that he might not have known the difference between Roman miles and Arabic miles. Back then, with what they knew of cartography of the world, well, your guess would have been as good as his. But as some believe, he just really sucked at math and totally lucked out finding land at all. I know a lot of people have questioned his IQ for various reasons. I'm going to get into that in just a little bit, but we'll find out who's exactly behind the centuries-long smear campaign against the most famous explorer in this history of the Western world. As we talked about before, Columbus seemed to be a smart guy by all accounts, educated anyway. He knew the world was round, really ahead of his time. And yes, he manipulated and lied and kind of shammed his way into the expedition that did end up opening up the gateway to the North and South American continents. <clears throat> the trade gateway, the colonization gateway, and yes, the slave trade gateway, which we will discuss in a moment. The exploration gateway to the New World predated Columbus by maybe as many as 70 years. Columbus may have hit the islands, but the mainland North America? Names like uh, Pedro de Velasco in 1452, uh, Jalvez Corte Real in uh, 1472, both have a strong claim with documentation that they may have landed on the New World before. But even those, back in uh, 1424, we find a nautical chart with what appears to be representation of the New World. So there really is no telling who discovered America, is there? Look, back then, 
hitting the Caribbean and thinking it was China. It really was an easy mistake. America, North or South, really wasn't mainstream. It had been discovered before, but if that's true, why didn't Columbus know where he landed? The answer to that, sadly, can be chalked up to primitive printing, publishing, and distribution. Besides, someone has to approve the map, and back then, maps were constantly changing. Thanks to another fellow we probably know by name, Italian explorer Amerigo Vespucci. Amerigo Vespucci was born in Florence, Italy in 1454. Family friends with the royal Medici family, Vespucci had pretty much every advantage you can think of. Right? He got to travel as a diplomat, became a banker in Spain, where he also obtained citizenship in 1505. Vespucci, it's reported, helped Columbus get the ships ready on the initial voyage. Sparking a uh, midlife shift in interests, Vespucci sets off to explore in his 40s. The Vespucci claim to the Americas is based on a letter dated 1497. The letter states a May 10th, 1497 date for his first voyage. There's controversy as historians are split on the validity of the letter. Some believe his first trip wasn't until 1499, but there is evidence Vespucci made the trip just up in the air as to when. He reportedly reached South America in just over a month. He went back to Spain the next year, prepped another voyage. This won the other first voyage. He hit the Amazon River, Cape St. Augustine. Back and forth he would go between the New World and Spain, discovering Rio de Janeiro and Rio de la Plata, and rediscovering South America over and over and over again. Found the Azores, uh, Sierra Leone, Brazil, but still, not North America. Vespucci's Italian, why doesn't he get the cultural love? The country is named after the guy, remember? America is a feminine form of Amerigo. And what about Ponce de Leon? The Spanish explorer that hit the waves looking for the fountain of youth, right? <laughs> Isn't that just a myth? In fact, trying to find the fabled fountain was never his selling point to King Ferdinand of Spain. There's no record in that in, in the commission of the expedition at all. The fabled fountain was always believed to have existed in Asia. So thinking they were close to Asia, Ponce took off, as Ponce was wont to do. In the Caribbean, on the island of Bimini is where the legends lead, and Juan went there. I mean, it was on the king's encouragement to find more gold and conquest, more lands, but not for the fountain. The connection Juan Ponce de Leon and the Fountain of Youth originate that connection originates after his death. It's fun to postulate, but old Juan did settle in the New World around Haiti in the early 1500s. When the king commanded, Ponce took a few ships north up the coast of Florida. This was in 1512, the year Vespucci died. Sadly, Ponce didn't know he was on a continent. He found Florida, named it that because it meant flowery, and he just assumed it was another island. But it had been inhabited for some time. Mm -mm. Spanish slavers had raided the islands and the close-by lands to export people, human trafficking. But later he was named governor of Bimini in Florida. Still did a better job than Ron DeSantis. Still, he found it, right? Just that it had already been found. Columbus, he died in 1506 in a Spanish monastery sort of sadly wrapped up in the delusions that he hit the East Indies and China and Japan were just north of his settlement. I mean, he went out on top, even if only in his own head. I mean, if the dude didn't discover America, did he really bring the disease and brutality? Yes, short answer. The Spaniards were unkind, brutal. The conquistadors were a cancer that spread throughout this new world. More like smallpox, the flu, common cold, any number of things that native people wouldn't have been exposed to otherwise. The imperialism and conquest, seeking to strip lands of their resources with no regard for the land or its peoples, isn't a new concept. 
It is a cornerstone of some of humankind's earliest tales. And Christopher Columbus's contributions to the slave trade and all of that, it's indisputable. Columbus may have revered these native people at first, but he also saw them as a prophet, and when his legacy was as an explorer was at stake, he doubled down on the slave export. That's right. When the gold and resources showed to be less than he first promised, he sold out human beings to save his own ass. So the real question is, would we be here if Columbus hadn't landed in Haiti? Well, check yourself and your own DNA to answer that question. For me, my people came from the United Kingdom, mostly. There are some other European ingredients in my stew, but mostly we're talking British, Scottish, with a bit of migration to Ireland. So I have to ask, would the pilgrims have even tried for this new world if not for Columbus's journey? Honestly, the conquest of the Spanish would likely have happened eventually. And the Aztec and Inca people's rich heritage may have still been annihilated. It's estimated Columbus's expedition was the patient zero that resulted in a 90% population decrease. On purpose or not, laying the blame on Columbus for that is circumstantial in just that it happened to be he who brought the six sailors over. Except, like I said, all of that was arguably inevitable. Here we sort of come to the end of the road, right? There are a lot of explorers out there with some claim to having discovered the New World. Columbus barely made it to the waters of Central America. Magellan went the other way. Vespucci never hit North America. De Leon hit Florida, but after slavers did. Slavers, you heard me. The North American continent, in just about as much likelihood as any other option, was discovered by Spanish slavers. That's a hard pill to swallow. Certainly nothing to celebrate. Kind of back to the Vikings, right? Maybe that isn't the most popular position, but just who discovered the southern portion of North America? The USA? We may never know for sure. What we do know for a fact is that it absolutely was not Christopher Columbus. Ah, hell, Christopher Columbus even isn't the guy's name. We've all have gardened that. Italiano es Cristoforo Colombo, or in Espanol, Cristobal Colón. Yeah, yeah how about we celebrate Colombo Day? Trench coats and lazy eyes for everybody. Still better than Colon Day. Okay. Crappy joke. Sorry. <laughs> so what's the real rub here? Columbus has probably more legitimate claim to the honor, if not the actual discovery. After all, Erickson's people fled after a decade, and Columbus's expedition opened the door for others. Vespucci gets the naming rights. Columbus's embarrassing legacy is somehow swept completely under the historical rug. There's been a subversive movement in America to discredit Columbus. Well, in fact, discrediting Columbus has been going on since Columbus first sailed. And while some of the hate and ridicule deservedly rests at the feet of Columbus himself, at least some of the anti-Columbus movement is steeped in the Ku Klux Klan's influence. Because Columbus was a Catholic, Italian, who flew the Spanish flag. Basically, the guy who discovered America wasn't their brand of white guy. So the smear campaign began. Now there's also La Leyenda Negra, which some say is the root of the anti-Columbus movement. Back in the mid-1500s, about half a century after Columbus wasn't around to defend his name, the Dutch and Spanish were in this nasty feud, and the Dutch used La Leyenda Negra anti-Spanish propaganda to portray the Spaniards as brutal, untrustworthy, and downright dastardly. Isn't it interesting to the, this day, even America's racist former president Donald Trump branded the Latin peoples in this light? La Leyenda Negra, still alive and well, just like the KKK. Yeah, it always comes back to racism. 
And while it may be true that Spanish conquistadors could be all those things and worse, there just isn't compelling evidence that Columbus was a hateful man set on destroying those people. That seems to be the infestation brought with him, but indications from his writings lead us to believe Columbus was in awe, struck in admiration for these people. These people he brutalized and enslaved when it served his purpose. The KKK has been instrumental in poisoning the well, so to speak. One might argue this whitewashing of Columbus and his role in the discovery of the good old U.S. of A. could be the work of the Klan. Actually, the Klan's infiltration into our legislative process is a whole nother episode. <laughs> so why do we celebrate Christopher Columbus? with such a conflicted, controversial past as the man who discovered America? The quick answer is because America needed a paid holiday. <laughs> yeah, uh, I wish there were more to it. But really, aren't all of our holidays centered around America's capitalist workforce engine? Why do we celebrate holidays at all? Do we as a people really need that much excuse to party? What about St. Patrick's Day? Washington? President's Day? All of them. And what's the difference between those fake holidays and Veterans Day, Labor Day, or, or Memorial Day even? St. Patrick's Day. Now I'm sentimental. My daughter was born on this holiday. So... Green, clovers, lucky stuff. It's just always kind of been a thing. Maddie's first glasses had shamrocks on them. She rocks the shamrocks, I used to joke. <laughs> St. Maddie's Day. But the much misrepresented St. Patrick has often been portrayed as something of a uh, Pied Piper. And, and no, he did not rid Ireland of a snake infestation. There weren't snakes in Ireland. St. Patrick wasn't even a saint. See? So many lies! Mywin Sukkot, his secret identity, wasn't even Irish. Uh, dude was probably born on the other isle. Some might compare what this guy did to Ireland's indigenous and superstitious peoples as uh, what Columbus did to the New World's peoples. So the legend of Mywin goes that as a teenager, he was enslaved by raiders, taken, sold into slavery. Six years of that, and he has this spiritual awakening, a vision never actually canonized by the Pope, he'd be more of a mystic missionary by today's standards. Sort of an uh, unsanctioned knocker on the doors. Not really for a church, just peddling the message of Christianity to the barbaric tribes of the Emerald Isle. <clears throat> he would seek to abolish slavery and human sacrifice through the spread of Christianity. Look! Maybe by driving the snakes out of Ireland, it was a metaphor for the savage tribes that brutalized others in inhumane ways. And speaking of inhumane, I said some might compare him to Columbus, but not in that way. As a matter of fact, St. Patrick's tactics were sort of lauded throughout history for converting people without slaughtering them. This is a man who was a child slave, escaped, trekked nearly 200 miles because a voice in his head told him a ship was waiting for him to take him back to his homeland. It was. Northern England, not Ireland. Ireland comes later. He had to convince the crew to sneak him away, which was insane. Think about that today. He, he's back with his family eventually. Things settle down, but the years that follow lead him to this calling, this sort of prophecy. He goes back to school to be ordained, studies Latin, masters Latin studies Christian theology, and rises all the way to bishop, then spends his last 30 years building churches, training, and ordaining priests and clergy and converting these druidic cavemen into non-human sacrificing Christians. New Testament style. So what the hell does shamrocks, green beer, and hashtag me too pinching someone's ass have to do with Mywin Sakat, St. Patrick, or any of it? While the legend is so far off the truth, why do we celebrate St. Patrick's Day if we aren't Irish? Do we even get that we're basically celebrating the conversion of the country to Christianity? St. Patrick, among other things, 
By teaching others and with the hand copying of sacred texts, it's argued that after the burning of Rome, St. Patrick is largely to thank for us having what we have of some of these documents today. Maybe that's worthy of pissing green for a few days. But a whole day dedicated to a guy the Pope didn't even make a saint? <laughs> I think I'll pass. Our nation's first president, George Washington, was a slave owner since he was 11 years old. When his father died, Georgie Porgy got the whole apple tree orchard. And I'm not kidding either. I am. I'm sorry. That's not a thing. The apple tree orchard, not a thing. He was willed 10 slaves. Now, I know what you're thinking. At least he didn't buy them. True. But before his 25th birthday, number one had already purchased about 15 or so human beings, including women and children. George Washington. But surely he didn't keep doing that. When he died in 1799, Mount Vernon enslaved 317 human beings. Bear in mind, some of those were from Martha's first marriage, and when her husband died, she was awarded some of those slaves, and legally, the Washingtons couldn't free those slaves, but would they have anyway? The quick answer is probably. George Washington, in his will, left orders to emancipate those enslaved by him upon Martha's demise. She didn't wait that long. I mean, honestly, knowing 300 plus people could be free if the missus dies. <laughs> I mean, yeah, she signed the order and the Washington slaves were freed on January 1st, 1801. Washington revolutionized agriculture in America, pushing manure. Yeah, our first president was a bullshit peddler, laying the groundwork for every president after. He was also a moonshiner. I'm not talking Jesse Duke. I'm talking a real upscale operation. And let's never forget the man who led the revolution and then stepped down. He was the man who could have been king. Still, two terms and he retired to farming, revolutionizing milling too. Washington had a state-of-the-art grist mill set up in 1791, one of the first automated mills in the country. It should also be noted, Washington lost a lot more battles than he won, but he was crafty when it counted. And that's what counts, right? Washington aside, the mere fact that we set aside a day to honor presidents, period, it seems strange. Nationalist cultism. In one lump, we honor both FDR and Nixon, Trump and Washington, Jefferson and Jackson, Obama and Reagan. Ugh. I believe if I may take this to no-no territory that if you're religious or superstitious, <clears throat> We're seeing a manifestation of the commandments, thou shalt make no graven images, and thou shalt have no other gods before me. Pragmatically, removal of all unprovable tales and sticking solely to fact, these tenets can be translated beyond higher power belief systems and into just basic human law, which, when you look at the Ten Commandments as we have, that's all they are. You could remove any specific god or religion and they apply to human life. Whatever your god is, is what you hold most sacrosanct, most holy, most revered. This is why I argue that even an atheist has a god. It might be food or booze or sports or family, but there's something that is above all else. Just because you don't pray to it doesn't mean you don't worship it. Worship. That's a word that's debated quite a bit when I talk about this subject. The definition of the word is clear. While they're all similar from different sources, as much as it pains me to reference Wikipedia, this really does sum it up nicely in a nutshell. <clears throat> worship is an act of religious devotion usually directed towards a deity. An act of worship may be performed individually in an informal or formal group or by a designated leader. Such acts may involve honoring. Let's break that down. Religious devotion. Religious simply just means relating to religion, but one definition creates a different context for this discussion. Treated or regarded with a devotion and scrupulousness appropriate to worship. So here we are, using the word to define the word. In math, those cancel out. So let's start over. An act of devotion usually directed towards the deity. The next part tells us it can be performed any number of ways. We'll get to that in a moment. The last part, too. It's all important. But first, devotion. 
Another word for that could be love or loyalty, even enthusiasm. We tend to think of certain words as being one-dimensional, and sometimes the thesaurus fails us, but not here. An act of love, loyalty, or enthusiasm, usually directed toward A. Now let's break down deity. Straightforward, this means god or goddess, creator, all-powerful, higher power. But it also conveniently means divine quality, status, or nature. Divine. Many definitions lead us to God, except one which stands out, again, excellent, delightful. This may sound like an English lesson, but words matter. We use them deliberately, so listen carefully to the next sentence. An act of love, loyalty, or enthusiasm usually directed towards something excellent or delightful. This is also a definition of worship. You see how loosely that can be applied? Now, how many times have you sat in front of your television binging the new season of whatever it is as soon as it's released? Congratulations! You've just been accepted into the Church of Netflix! Please, don't be offended. I'm not judging. I've done the same thing. But this type of behavior speaks to a le level of cognitive dissonance when it comes to separating our religions with our actions. So when you look at that sentence, an interpretation of the word worship. Do you understand where the lines can be blurred? For some of you, this won't apply. For most, maybe if you're honest. Homework, examine your life, the last month. What do you give more regard and attention to than your religion? And examine the definition of the word worship that I'm offering. I'm going to want five things, and you can come up with them, I promise. An act of love, loyalty, or enthusiasm, usually directed towards something excellent or delightful. You can do this by yourself with someone else or a group or someone else can lead you through it. So Netflix, Netflix and chill, TV watch party, yoga. Wow. I'm just doing TV here. You know, you, you can really look at just about anything, right? Specifically, whatever you're listening to me on right now. Yeah, we worship our phones, don't we? Now, that last part of the wiki definition, that's the fun uniting point. Such acts may involve honoring. Isn't that what we always talk about, about Confederate statues coming down? We're honoring the dead. Thou shalt have no gods before me, no graven images. Remember the satire magazine in France a few years ago that got attacked because of a cartoon depiction of a religious icon? Well, that sort of disrespect is forbidden in more strict sects of that faith. And from what I understand, it's foundationally offensive to even the most casual observer of the faith. I'm not saying anyone deserves to be harmed on any level. Get that right. But what I'm saying is, we tend to have a very flip attitude toward just about everything. It's a cultural difference mostly, but it's hard to argue that we take our faith and religion seriously when we allow it to be parodied and bastardized the way we do in the name of, uh... ooh, this one's gonna hurt, free speech. That's right. How many times do we put the First Amendment over our religion? All the time. Unless we're just all okay with Jesus as a superhero in South Park. We don't take our faith as Christians or Americans or anything very seriously. If I said, God is dead, that might be offensive, but it's my right to say it in America. So if that's blasphemy to you, but it's okay by the American constitutional standards, which one is your Bible? Which one do you worship? Yeah, think about this for a moment, and I am not advocating theocracy. In fact, my personal belief is that any and all fairy tales need to be kept as far away from general legislation as humanly possible. I'd like my individual elected officials to be guided by a set of moral, ethical, and humane principles, but I don't, I don't need those to be tied to a specific religion. 
I've met atheists who did a better job of explaining love thy neighbor than many Christians I've come across. But when it comes to legislating out of the Bible, I don't want that any more than I want legislated out of any religious book. I am a man of faith, but I'm led by fact, guided by faith. Big difference. So when I speak of us not taking it seriously, I'm not saying we should. I'm saying you should check yourself for your own hypocrisies in this area. And for the sake of this episode, every time we celebrate someone, aren't we worshiping them? Look outside Chicago's basketball arena. There's a huge statue to Michael Jordan. Do you believe he's not and was not worshipped? Like a god. The man was even called a basketball god. Have you ever referred to anybody as a god of anything? This is some hard stuff to swallow, folks, but it's relevant. And yes, this episode is about Columbus and Columbus Day. And we can debate whether or not Columbus should be honored and whether or not he even discovered America. But I'm saying from a bigger perspective, why are we celebrating these men, women, etc. at all? Should we celebrate Columbus Day or any day for anyone? Follow me. Doesn't it make sense that if we examine worship through the less restrictive religious bindings of the word and take a hard look at ourselves and how we behave and be accountable for that, then we would be a little more careful, deliberate, regarding to whom or what we apply that worship. I'm not saying abolish all holidays. Holidays give us time off work. They give us an opportunity to bond in different ways, to explore cultural heritage that we may not have ever sampled. And they offer a unity in many cases. Columbus Day, while traditional, probably deserves a fresh perspective. But as we move forward, let's take pause on exactly what we are going to celebrate instead. From the 4th of July to Juneteenth, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. Many days and holidays set aside to commemorate one thing or another. But when we set aside a day to honor an individual, we're opening up a Pandora's box of that pesky old purity test we've talked about before. Individuals are flawed and subject to scrutiny. The idea they stood for, that's something different altogether. In the instance of Columbus Day, maybe commemorating the indigenous peoples of the lands or the idea of bringing together Europe and the New World. Offering an Italian Heritage Day may be something to consider since many Italians have embraced Columbus Day as their holiday. However, when we begin to break down cultural heritage celebrations, let's not forget that Spaniards opened the door for the Western slave trade back then Italians had their hand in it, too, with their fair share of explorers. Plus, to celebrate Italian heritage, it's important to understand we have to have a complete removal of all things Catholicism before we begin. After all, it is the Catholic Church that's lied to the entire world for centuries. In fact, it's the lies and mistruths and misrepresentations in our modern theology that causes so much strife today. In fact, hidden scrolls, books of the Bible, diminishing the role of women in deciding by votes of men that Jesus Christ was divine and not a prophet. Look, that was a recruitment scam. Conversion tactic. Nobody follows a guy. Everybody follows a God. Take that with the lengthy history of sex abuse and the deliberate whitewashing of Christianity as we know it. Think about this. Without many of the ordered great works of the Renaissance, you might have known Jesus was black or, or at very least Middle Eastern Jew. Much, much, much sooner. Certainly not a white guy. Italians and Catholics are not the same. Catholics and the Catholic Church aren't either. It's important to note that. So how about an Immigrants Day, where all Americans can celebrate their own individual heritage together? Consensual Immigrants and Non-Consensual Immigrants Day. God, we really are the terrorists. Columbus Day is, is in large part just another day for Americans to take off work. 
So let's wash away the lies and the filth of history and celebrate something, create something that works for all of us and honors the right ideals. St. Patrick's Day has been reduced to, from an Irish heritage celebration into a hallmark commercialized greener version of Valentine's Day, which isn't even worth getting into in this episode, in case you're wondering. And I don't knock the incredible accomplishments of a man like Martin Luther King Jr. But we could take that holiday and make it about the idea, a much bigger idea than a man. The same with St. Patrick. I'm wondering... Is the immortal soul of our nation going through a test right now? Of the 10 national paid holidays, only four of them are set aside for individuals. Can you name them? 40% of our holidays are set aside to honor individual people. The birthdays of Martin Luther King Jr. and George Washington. Columbus Day. and Christmas. That's right, Christopher Columbus, George Washington, and Martin Luther King Jr. have just as many paid holidays in America as Jesus H. Christ. Biggest party notwithstanding, lumping these men together is problematic at best, and it has very little to do with individual virtue or controversy. It has to do with what we hold dear, holy, and sacrosanct. Turning it to current events, when we see statues toppled, specifically of old Confederate icons, and seeing how some uneducated Southerners idolize their traitor heroes, we maybe see some universal balance unfolding with the graven images and number one God commandments. Couldn't one argue that these moves to take statues down and change holidays are a cosmic correction? Taking the narcissism and all about meanness out of the human element out of the event, a focus on more of the ideas that are more universal to everyone. Lastly, I want to leave you with these thoughts. First, history lessons and malign men aside, I hope this gives us some food for thought for how we approach the things in our own lives that we choose to celebrate and how it compares against the things we supposedly hold so sacred. Maybe overthinking holidays helps us rethink the way we celebrate. And finally, American store shelf staples like Aunt Jemima, Mrs. Butterworth, and Uncle Ben have been retooled to remove the racist slave depictions from their branding that have caused some backlash. Some aren't taking that well. But let's remember that history is written by the victors. The victims don't tell the tales. History just happens to them. It's the responsibility of those at the time to tell the stories pragmatically and unbiased so future generations can learn from them. The truth almost always finds a way to the surface. It may take centuries. However, we must know the difference as a civilization between rewriting history and writing the wrongs of history. <laughs> Coming up, I'm taking America's bully culture full circle to discuss the history of cancel culture. I'm going to tell you why cancel culture can become a cancer culture and why we all need to see this era of political correctness as an opportunity for personal correction. I'm getting more into my story about how country radio treated the Dixie Chicks and how some other callbacks to earlier this season from Ellen to Kevin Spacey and more. We're going to learn why cancel culture isn't a new phenomenon and why it's got some people so upset. So catch up on past episodes of Overthinking Everything as I'm deconstructing a culture of cultism. Thanks for joining me. Check out some of my other videos on YouTube and make sure you check out my original music. I got it all set up in a playlist for you along with my TikTok. So like, share, subscribe to this channel and do all the things I need you to do. Consider a donation if you would to Cash App if you like what you hear or subscribe on Patreon. Just stay here. I'm Josh Brandon and I'm overthinking everything.